Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Digital Equality, Finding Inclusion in Online Spaces, with Martin Sortel and Jody Holbach from Access to Arts. My name is Frances and I'm delighted to be your host for today's session. But first I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the many countries throughout Australia and from where you're all joining us from today. I acknowledge and pay my respects to the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians on the, of the lands and waters upon which I am lucky enough to live, work and play here in Sydney. I pay my deep respects to their elders, past, present and future, and extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today. If you would like, please feel free to share in the chat which country you are joining us from. So now on slide is on screen is a blue and gold PowerPoint slide. There's a gold semicircle in the top right hand corner. There's some gold and orange text with some white text and video boxes with our guest speakers and also an interpreter. I'm a woman in my early 30s with fair skin, wavy blonde hair, blue eyes and today wearing a navy and white striped dress. Uh, in the background is my living room. You can see some plants behind me, some artworks on the wall and a uh, couch. These sessions have been designed and produced for you and explore the topics of leadership, artistic and digital adaptation. Thank you for continuing to join us uh, through these live webinars. I acknowledge that um, digital screen fatigue is real, um, but we really hope that the recordings are also uh, providing to be a useful tool to refer back to as we navigate these ever-changing times together. But before I hand over to Martin and Jody this morning, I wanted to bring your attention to our National Arts and Disability Awards through the Australia Council for the Arts. These opened uh, for nominations last Friday and are awards to celebrate the works and achievements of both established and young artists and the significant contributions of artists with disability to the vibrancy of the Australian arts sector. Last year, we celebrated the awards on National Day of Person with a Disability at the National Portrait Gallery in Canberra, which was amazing to all be together at, awarding Janice Florence and Dion Beasley. Uh, you have now until early September to submit your nominations for this year's awards, and you can find out more information on how to do this on our website, which I believe we're posting in the chat now. Um, anyone can submit a nomination, and we encourage you to spread the word with your friends and colleagues, please. So now you will have attended our webinars before, so I'll keep the housekeeping quick. Live captioning is available via Zoom and can be turned on and off using the CC button below. As always, please use the chat feature to engage with each other throughout today, share any links, anything that comes to mind. And similarly, if you have a question, please use the Q&A tab at the bottom rather than the chat feature, just so we don't lose your question in the chat. We'll aim to get through as many questions as we can by the end of today's session. We're joined by David and Elisa, Ozan interpreting throughout. So thank you so much for both being here. And finally, a recording of today's webinar with transcript will be available after the session around mid next week, um, which we'll send to you via email with any links and PowerPoints from today also. So now on screen is a navy blue PowerPoint slide to introduce our guest speakers. There is a title to introduce both Martin and Jody next to their headshots, both square cropped images in format. On the top right is an image of a man with fair skin wearing black rimmed glasses and a black leather jacket, sitting side on looking at the camera. On the bottom left is an image of a woman with fair skin, wavy shoulder length blonde hair, wearing a turquoise collared shirt and standing in front of a white background. Martin and Jody both work at Access to Arts. Martin is the business director and in his bio outlines that growing up, he actually wanted to be an astronaut, but instead fell in love with arts administration. Lucky us. <laughs> He's now also spent the last seven years at Access to Arts, an independent peak body based in Adelaide on Ghana country to represent, advocate and at, um, respond to the needs of arts and disability sectors. Jody has worked at Access to Arts for the past five years and is currently in the role of Access Services Coordinator. Jodie is a longtime patron of the arts herself, particularly theatre and dance, 
and herself has been involved with ballroom dancing, tap dancing and jazz, which I think I love these fun facts. They're so great to hear. Jodi has a background in law and has spent many years advocating for people who are vision impaired in various areas. She has now moved into audio description coordination and also assist Martin um, with business administration. It's been a great pleasure to get to know Martin and Jodi over the past few weeks and gain more of an understanding of the work that they do at Access to Arts. We're thrilled to have them here today to talk to us about digital equality and the right to access information. Everyone has an obligation and a role to play to support disabled people in this way. And today, Martin and Jody will explore what inclusion should look like in online spaces. Martin and Jody, thank you both so much for being here and sharing your thoughts. I'll now hand over to you and share your PowerPoint slides. Thank you. Do you want to go Thanks. first, Martin? Thanks, Francis. Yeah, I'll, I'll go first. Um, welcome to everyone. Hello, uh, I'm on Ghana country in South Australia, uh, in, uh, in the scene of the Adelaide Plains. So, hello. Um, I am, I think Francis actually did a really good job of um, describing what I look like. I haven't really got a lot to add other than I'm a little bit older than the photo would suggest. Not hugely, but um, anyway. I'm sitting in my home office and you can see me wearing a uh, tan coloured uh, uh, vest, padded vest, because it's cold in my house. So I almost start. Uh, first of all, wanted to give you all a bit of our bit of information about access to arts and the background of the organisation, and then I'll hand over to Joni. She will explore some specific elements about um, different um, um, access uh, services that should be made available online when we go into an online space and then finally I'll conclude with a bit of a talk about uh, online equality and inclusion. So yeah, hopefully uh, we'll, and then we'll have some time for Q&A. So I will be in. So access to one, so can you put the next Slide on, please. So Access to Arts was established as an independent body in 2013 to represent, advocate and respond to the needs of deaf and disabled people in the arts and disability sectors. Access and access to art, we are paving the way for access in the art and disrupting the notion of what access means to many people in the arts sector. Our programs, such as our live audio subscription service and our Beats digital contemporary music program for learning and participants, are empowering deaf and disabled people to engage in the arts how they want to, as consumers or, or as creators. Access to arts is recognised locally, nationally and internationally as experts in access and inclusion and as thought leaders in the field of uh, the fields of arts and disability. As a sector development organisation, we support South Australia's disabled artists and art companies to make some of the most unique, experimental and exciting art in Australia. We do that through developing knowledge, skills, 
resilience and pathways. We do it by providing services and seeding projects in response to what's needed. Access to arts is disability led. This means over 51% of our senior management and board identify as deaf or, and dis deaf or dis disabled people. Our staff are passionate about the arts and providing opportunities for deaf and disabled people in this sector. Access to Arts is committed to meet best practice models in your organisation, governance and disability leadership. We are informed by the social model of dis disability that views disability as a barrier that people experience when participating in society. These barriers um, are identified as attitudinal, systemic or organisation, physical, communication or informational and technology based. The social model of disability believes that all of, a, all of society has a responsibility to address these barriers. As access to arts, we believe that everyone has an equal right to access art and culture, but many deaf and disabled people face barriers to their access. Access to arts addresses these barriers by building capacity in deaf and disabled people who want to be involved in the arts at any level, as audiences, participants, artists, arts workers, arts leaders and board members. We also support people by building capacity of the broader arts sector to become more inclusive and accessible. As a access to arts, we celebrate the unique perspectives, stories, and aesthetics of deaf and disabled artists. We demonstrate the value of telling authentic stories through art, including art that can challenge, reveal, and reflect disability as a rich and intrinsic part of the human experience. So now I will hand over to Joni, um, who will go through, uh, talk to you about some um, various items. But first, I wanted to kind of present a video of what Access to Arts believes digital access can look like. Uh, this is a video we uh, worked in, participate or in conjunction with the city of Adelaide a number of years ago, where we're discussing uh, the U United Nations um, um, uh, Convention on the Rights of People with Disability, where investigating Article 30, which outlines disabled people's uh, rights to participate in cultural life recreation, leisure and sport. So if we can play that. No, severely not. Diverse range of deaf and disabled people. United Nations Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. Black and white footage of a diverse range of deaf and disabled people reciting text. 
We see men and women, young and old, in black clothes, their skin luminous against a black backdrop. Grainy film effects have been added to the footage, and we see English and Auslan users side by side with captions along the bottom of the screen. Article 30, participation in life, creation, leisure and sport. Article 30, participation in cultural life, recreation, leisure and sport. People with disability have the same right to take part in cultural life as other people do. Call call with no dot bell book in order form of limit. Television programs, film and theatre. Places for cultural performances or services, such as theatres, museums, cinemas, libraries and tourism services. As far as possible, monuments and sites are culturally important to the nation. Countries are to take steps to make it possible for people with disability to develop and use their creative, artistic and intellectual abilities, not only for their own benefit, but for the benefit of society. Countries are to take steps to make sure that copyright laws are in place to protect people's ideas, writing, pictures or inventions from being copied. Do not discriminate against people with disability who are trying to access cultural materials in different formats. People with disability are entitled, in the same way other people are, to be recognised for their own culture and language, including sign languages and deaf culture. Encourage people with disability to take part in sports with people without disability as far as possible. My hope is to be free and to be free and to be free and to be free and to be free. Make sure people with disabilities have the opportunity to organise, develop and take part in sport, recreation and music concerts that are especially with disabilities. Children with disability also have access to play, recreation, leisure and sporting activities in the same way as other children. An access to arts production featuring Andrew Bull, Lorna Hallahan, Amanda Cullen, Jan Mobbs, Catherine Ania, Catherine Evans, Kylie Thornley, Isadora Drummond Sweeney, John Wolanski, Josh Canton, and Anton Cirillo, Katrina Parker, Michelle Ryan, Lucas Thornley, Liliana Bull, Simon Max, Michael Hodile, Louise Weekly, Charles Max, Nick Shumi, and Tori Cullen. Creative direction by Gail Mellis, production coordinator Amber Venner, video production Scott Venner. Music copyright DJ Trip 2014. Access to Arts Partner, Adelaide City Council. Communication Republic 2014. Thank you for that. Um, I'm Jodie, I'm on the Access Services Coordinator at Access to Arts. Uh, I'm sitting in my kitchen at my kitchen table. Um, I pretty much look like the photo that was on your screen, except for I've had my hair cut a couple of inches, so it's um, you know sort of bob style. I'm wearing a, a plain-ish round neck, dropped shoulder knitted jumper in an eggshell blue, and behind me is probably sort of a dirty cream wall, and maybe my ironing board. <laughs> um, I'd also like to acknowledge and pay my respects to um, Ghana land and Ghana people, past, present and future, which is also the land that I am privileged to be on. Well, we, um, when you're looking at access, 
for digital content. Do we need to have the latest technology? Do we need to have um, absolutely everything up to date? Well, in some aspects, yes, we do. However, bear in mind that a lot of adaptive technology is often one step behind uh, the actual norm, uh, regular technology that everyone else uses. So you just need to keep that in, in mind when you are actually looking at your, your technology, your platform and what sort of digital content you are putting. You do need to keep up with uh, um, advances in things like um, audio description, mm -hmm. captioning, Ausland, um, Easy Read, Easy English, just so that you are up to date with the latest trends and, and acknowledges. So for an example, the video we show, we show for a couple of reasons. One, because the content is very real uh, mm -hmm. and it very much represents um, Article 30 of um, the United Nations Convention. But also in that video, um, some of the language used in the audio description, we've actually advanced from. So we no longer say, uh, we see, we find that as redundant language. So we remove that and which gives us then more time to actually put in more descriptive language or leave pauses for people to actually think and consider what they're actually visualising in their heads. So that's, that's a very classic example of that. It doesn't mean the description is wrong, it just means that it's an older form of description, but it will tell you the same information. <laughs> So everything keeps evolving and that's what you need to be in mind of. You know, in the days of technology, we have been forced into using a digital flat platform due to the virus and you know, I don't think it will leave anytime soon as much as um, we are, or most states are starting to go back to, I guess, a new form of normal. Um, you know, video digital content is still quite prominent, um, you know, in businesses and society in itself. So audio description, do you need to have um, full audio description on your digital content? The short answer is no, longer answer is yes. So let me explain. So with audio description, a lot of people know it as something that is used to describe movies and films um, and, you know, longer content like that. Do you have to have that complete content on your, say, your web page? No, not unless it is actually warranted. Things you need to keep in mind around description are if you have graphics. So if you have a link that is a graphic, bear in mind for someone who's using, using a screen reader, that will just say graphics. Screen readers won't read the graphic. It'll tell you it's a graphic, but it won't tell you what the graphic is. In some aspects now, they actually will take a guess at what the photo, if it's a photo, they will take a guess at what the photo is, uh, but they're often really not too close to the mark at all. So if it's a link and a graphic, it needs to be tagged with some kind of um, text so people can actually um, understand what that link is about. If you have a photograph, do you have to describe that photo in absolute detail? No, not unless for some reason it is a part of um, something you're trying to demonstrate and it needs, you need, person needs to actually understand what the detail is in that, in that photograph. So you can use a short sentence uh, to, to describe a photograph. Um, by example, you could just say, um, a middle-aged man reading a, a book, and if the book is titled, you could also say what the novel or book is. So it just gives a, a very overview image of what the actual photograph is. And often you, you will see photographs in reports and um, 
different types of documents. And for that reason, you don't need a full description because it then detracts from what the actual document is trying to say. So you need to use a bit of um, discretion as to whether your description needs to be detailed or it just needs to be more of an overview. Um, with photos, you can use an alt text method, uh, which you then can put your own little description on instead of using a computer generated one. So then people will actually get an idea of what the photo actually is, not what the computer feels that it is. If you have a video, this is where you need to get into more your um, longer type description. One of the big rules around description is when you are uh, writing or recording a description, you cannot describe over natural dialogue. So, you know, often it's best to get some advice or ask a professional organisation, there are a few around Australia, to write the description for you um, and tell you how to embed it into your, your video. There are a number of different technologies around that will insert your description. Um, you can either tell it what to insert or it will make it up and insert it for you. But what they do is they actually stop the video and insert it and in an electronic voice and then run the video again. So what that actually does is it interrupts the continuity of the video you're watching and can distract. Um, I have seen, um, as a person who uses audio description myself, I have seen that kind of um, description and it's really, really distracting. And actually, sometimes I actually have to turn it off, watch the video and then turn it on to watch the video and get the visuals um, because it's so distracting. Distracting It, it um, takes away from what the actual, um, the image and story is of that video. If for some reason um, there is a lot of dialogue on your video, you can actually have a written description um, next to the video explaining that, you know, the audio description uh, was unable to be inserted into this video and actually have a description of what is going on in the video at the same time the dialogue is occurring. So there are different methods you can use. Some obviously are better than nothing in some aspects. Some um, are better than others. When we get to people who are deaf um, and captioning, I think the most important thing that people forget is that people who are deaf and speak Auslan, Auslan is not English per se, it is its own language. So if you're going to have captions, you need to you need to be in mind that not everyone who um, speaks Auslan is going to be able to follow the cap captions fluently um, enough to keep up. That is a possibility. It doesn't always occur. Um, some people think, oh, well, I've got captions, that's enough. And in a lot of circumstances, it actually isn't enough. So um, that's when you need to have um, a, an interpreter either on your screen, um, put, you know, in the corner or shadowing the person who's doing the dialogue. There's many different ways um, that it can be inserted into a video um, or anything that it has an audio content. Captioning. When you get to captioning, there are two different types of captioning. Um, there's open captions and closed captions. Both of these um, will keep the same information, so it will give information around the dialogue, um, the word for word of the dialogue that a person is speaking, as well as information around sounds that are actually embedded into video or talk or whatever you're trying to do. Open captions are um, transposed straight on to the video and cannot be turned on and off. 
they are probably the easiest ones to put on, but you need to sort of know your audience and know how um, it's going to affect your audience. So if you're, um, you know, trying to attract the non-disabled sector who may be um, distracted by captions, uh, you may need to have um, a, a method where you can turn the captions on and off. So an open caption system may not be suitable. Um, so that would be a closed caption and the closed captions are embedded into a video and they're, they're coded in so you can actually switch them on and off instead of having them actually on the video. So it's an individual user system. And people think that caption is only for people who have hearing difficulties. Um, no, it's not. Often captions can uh, assist people um, if you've been in, say you're down at the, the local club and the video, the TV's on, you wanna watch the TV that, you know, but it's quite noisy. So for, for people who are, um, that are able to hear and are non-disabled, captions can also assist them to actually watch a TV in a, in a noisy environment. So it's not just for um, a particular audience. It can have further reaching benefits than just for people who are deaf. So it's good to consider those um, as in, you just need to know your audience um, to have them on. There are uh, companies that can, again, around Australia that can assist you to um, embed these into your videos, um, provide some advice um, around these kinds of methods. So you just need to, you know, said, be aware, be aware of your audience. Again, so that will bring us to um, easy English and Eng easy read documents, which have been around not too long, but have sort of really taking off at the moment. And what are easy read and easy English? And is there a difference? Yes, there is a difference between them. Um, so if we have an easy read document, there are often documents that are directed at people who have, may have some learning difficulties, English may not be their first language. So what the document's made up of is very plain written English, but also graphics. <laughs> so the graphics will indicate, um, you know, what you're speaking about. A little bit like, you know, when um, computers came out, uh, the Windows-based computers come out and, you know, you did have a little envelope to suggest that that's your mailbox. So different little graphics like that to be able to um, assist the person to understand what the English is about. Now, in easy English, it is just plain English. It doesn't have graphics. Uh, but what it also doesn't have is very flowery language that, you know, often people need to go to the dictionary and look up what someone's actually meant by a particular word. Again, this assists people who, um, you know, varying stages of English as a second language and also varying stages of learning disability. Um, but also sometimes it just assists the average person to understand what um, your document is about. So if it's a you know, fairly hefty report um, of some kind, um, and an English, an easy English document would pretty much summarize that report in a very in easy way. You don't actually have to dumb it down. Um, that's not what it's about. Um, it's, it's about just using plain um, English to get your point across and being able to put that you know 30 page document into something like three pages um, in a summary that is easy to read for people to understand. Now just because you provide this seems to be a mess if you provide um, these accessible features people are going to come. Uh, well, unfortunately, it doesn't quite work like that because people won't come if they don't know it's there. And if they've been previously and you haven't had some accessible features, you know, it's very unlikely that 
they're going to chat back on a regular basis to see whether you've upgraded your services. So what you need to do is understand your audiences that you need to target, invite them along, build a rapport and a trust with that community to be able to um, understand what their needs and requirements are and what their access requirements mm -hmm. are and what um, best suits uh, a group of people. Um, while you know everyone has different and varying individual requirements. Um, it's very hard on something like a digital flat platform when you have a group of people to meet everyone's individual requirements. So you need to um, keep it fairly general and be able to meet um, the standard of requirements for the audience that you have chosen. And hopefully then the, that audience will be connected with you and the, your digital content, whether it's via a webinar or um, a Zoom meeting or just a web page, is able to actually um, access your information and, you know, can be a part of what you do. Thank you. I'm going to hand back to Martin now. All right. Thank you, Jody. Um, I'm back. So, um, we, Jody talked about it, uh, why we do um, make things accessible and what our responsibility is for uh, the uh, the equity and the discrimination of uh, disabled people who may consume information in different ways. Um, that's, I think that's really, um, you know, explained quite well why. Um, with the, the um, very similar viewing uh, video uh, that Access Alliance did, uh, that explores Article 5, which is about the responsibility to provide equality and non-discrimination in information and uh, for some people. So if uh, that could be cued, please. Hi, Martin. Sorry, just jumping in. I, I didn't have this one ready to go. Apologies. So I'm just going to have to unshare my screen, quickly find it in my emails and bring it up. But um, if you could just continue for a sec, I'll bring uh, it up in two minutes. Sure. I'll while Francis comes, uh, finds that one, uh, it'll lead basically the video, I think will link into what I wanted to finish our talk about, which is about digital equality. So in a lot of ways, advances in technology are transforming the lives of many disabled people. Uh, enabling their participation in things that were previously precluded from them. This technology-driven transformation is having a radically positive impact on many disabled people. However, through uh, those new products and services uh, continue to expand access, at a seemingly exponential rate, accessibility isn't always built into them from the start. By making technology, technologies, products and services more readily usable by people with sensory, physical or learning impairment, organisations have the opportunity to grow their share of an expanding audience base. Now I see Francis popped up, so I think now for you. Sorry. the video might be ready, so I'll United Nations Convention. play that first. United Nations Convention on the Rights of Disabilities. Black and white footage of a diverse range of deaf and disabled people reciting text. We see men and women, young and old, in black clothes, their skin luminous against a black backdrop. 
grainy film effects have been added to the footage and we see English and Auslan users side by side with captions along the bottom of the screen. Article 5. Equality and Non-Discrimination Article 5. Equality and Non-Discrimination Countries agree that everyone is equal before the law. They are to make sure people with disability are not treated unfairly just because of their disability and are protected by the law in the same way other people are. To make sure they are treated fairly, countries are to take appropriate steps to make sure people with disability receive some extra assistance or have practical changes made for them where this is needed to put them in the same position as people without disability. The extra assistance or practical change cannot be too hard to carry out. People without disability cannot claim that it is unfair for people with disability to receive special treatment. If a country has special laws or programs that help put people with disability in the same position as other people, then this is not discrimination. An Access to Arts production featuring Carly Thornley, Catherine Ania, Katrina Parker, Lorna Hallahan, Katrina Lancaster Max, David Paul Jobling, Charles Max, and Michelle Ryan. Creative direction by Gail Mellis, production coordinator Amber Venner, video production Scott Venner, music copyright DJ Trip 2014, Access to Arts partner Adelaide City Council, Communication Republic 2014. Right, thank you, Francis. So everyone that is kind of providing a bit more context as to why making things accessible is really important. We're working towards uh, creating equality uh, and we're not discriminating about or uh, against disabled people. So I'll return to so think back to what I just said about the advances in technology and how that is making things more the potentially making things more accessible for a lot of disabled people. But if they're not, they're often not being built in from the start. So I'll continue the. Uh, the internet is an increasingly important resource in many aspects of life. In education, employment, government, healthcare, recreation and more. It's important that the web be accessible to deaf and disabled people in order to provide equal access and equal opportunity to everyone. An accessible web can help people, particularly deaf and disabled people, take a more active role in society. And having an accessible website plays an important part in creating an accessible web. Furthermore, what you do to meet best practice for accessibility often overlaps with other best practices, such as in mobile web design, usability, and search engine optimization. But the web is not accessible to all of the people all of the time. Some of, some of the common barriers arising from inaccessible web-based products include a lack of proper keyboard navigation, preventing users from moving logically around the page using their tab and shift tab keys, pages that are overly busy, lacking clear distinction between items, which can result in an information overload for users. The use of excessive graphic interfaces it can often impact on a screen reader's ability 
to identify and describe elements of a page. Using flash technology can exclude and exclude users using screen renders and poorly designed pages that don't consider contrast and colouring are also barriers to people with low vision and colour blindness. So the question is, how can you tell if your website is accessible? There are a number of relatively simple tests you can do yourself right now to get a sense of your website's accessibility. These tests or these checks shouldn't be or shouldn't replace getting uh, tested by an expert, but they can be revealing and can offer practical ways uh, to get acquainted with some accessibility best product, uh, best practice. Uh, here are a few accessibility tests you can do yourself. Um, you can attempt to use your website without using a mouse. Zoom your page up to 200%. Use your site on a phone or mobile device. Turn on high contrast. All of these you may discover that it's not as using your website is not as usable as you thought. The web content accessibility guidelines, WCAG 2.0 and 2.1, set out a range of recommendations for making web content more accessible. WCAG applies to dynamic content, multimedia, mobile platforms, and more. WCAG also can apply, can be applied to non-web information and communication technologies. The guidelines, those WCAG guidelines are issued by the World Web, World Wide Web Consortium, W3C. They are an international community of corporate, government and user representatives who work to develop web standards. Whenever you are creating new web spaces, testing for proper accessibility is essential and best practice recommends that this is carried out by disabled people. In this internet dominated era, accrual access to information must take into consideration the diversity of the web users, as well as the way people use the internet. With some 2.5 million Australians not online, there are real concerns about how we manage digital inequality. This means addressing personal and organisational uh, um, digital inequality has it ever been more important. Today, most recently witnessed in the response to the COVID pandemic, Australia is experiencing a rapid digital transformation of economic, government, cultural and social systems. For people lacking effective internet access and digital skills, these are the digitally excluded, this transition deepens social inequality. Offering a web that is accessible for deaf and disabled people created through using accessible technology, 
design and other forms of accessibility is both socially progressive and financially rewarding. It will expand an organisation's reach and customer base, enabling access to some of the most productive, motivated and loyal uh, employees and patrons for today and the future. So, that is the end of uh, the presentation and we have just enough time for any questions. So, Francis, are there any questions? Thank you so much, um, Martin and Joe. That was just such an important and useful and practical session on just some of the small changes that we can make. And I think it, um, it will be really helpful for people to be able to interrogate that. So thank you for your time. We have had, excuse me, we have had a couple of questions come through. Um, and actually one that was sort of touching on uh, the last point you were making about digital equality. So I just wanted to, to follow that up with this question, which is, what do you see or what, what do you consider to be, sorry, we don't use the word see anymore. Thank you, Jody, also for pointing that out. What do you consider as the difference between equality and equity in terms of access in the digital space? Well, I mean, there's the, the way of looking at equality as you know, balance the idea of everyone gets the same. Uh, so, and then the the equality idea is about get yeah, everyone gets what they need to make a playing field level for everyone. So, one individual may need, you know. Um, screen reader or supported screen reader, but someone else may need supported screen reader, plus they may need uh, captioning and they need plain language. And I think it's about, you know, making sure there are, each person can, has access to what they need to make the playing field with the digital landscape uh, accessible to them. Yeah. That's the necessary thing for um, finding, um, yeah, equality. Yeah, and it's something that we're all learning so much at a rapid pace, like you mentioned, in this new digital space. I think it's particularly important. Um, just a reminder, if anyone has any questions for Jody and Martin, we've probably got a couple more minutes. I know we've run over, so thank you for, for hanging over out. But we've, we've just got another one that's come through, which talks about the overwhelming nature. Sometimes it can feel a bit overwhelming on, on if you don't have the lived experience of disability, knowing where to start with access. Um, what advice would you give to a small organisation on what are the first steps? Um, or some suggestions on people to speak to? Well, I think the first, you know, like I said before, I think talking to uh, disabled people and recognising that, oh, well, this disabled person said it's fine for them, that doesn't always mean that it's going to be fine for everyone. I think engaging with a diverse reference group of uh, disabled people can be very good. There are also a number of most uh, disability arts organisations, like the state bodies, big state bodies, have fact sheets or information that people can implement just to get the quick wins that, you know, they can start making that, that, those changes uh, and then just have a bit of a plan for, okay, this year we want to address this change. And then once that's 
done, knowing that I go wrong next. We're seeking to achieve this. So I think it can be very overwhelming to look and say, oh my God, we've got to fix everything. Yes, you do need to fix everything. But to kind of expect I have to fix everything right now, uh, like this very second, can be that, you know, they won't do anything. Whereas I think if you say, okay, well, we want to, we know our objective is that we get everything done, but, yeah, it might be a two-year or three-year stage progression. Um, totally. That's such, that's such good advice, I think, as well, as to take away that feeling of being overwhelmed by everything that needs to change quickly. And, and really um, coming back to Jody's point as well about how quickly language can change, you know, in this space too. So trying to make sure that you're on top of what is happening by keeping in, in contact with the right people. Um, I think we can just squeeze in one more, if that's okay with you both. Um, Jody, I don't know if you're, um, you have, we don't, have, we don't have your screen on at the moment, but that's fine if that's all good. There we are, nice. You know, <laughs> so keeping in mind about um, only one person on the screen. At a oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, yeah sorry, I should have mentioned for Q&A, we should be okay. Um, but this one's from Susan Broadway, so I'll leave it to up to you who wants to answer, but is um, if everyone has differing needs, um, oh, sorry, it just disappeared from me as I was reading it. Um, if everyone has differing needs, how can we ensure universal access? Uh, well, universal access is a principle in itself and universal access means that um, it should be accessible to everybody. Uh, so it depends on which side the access comes from. So if it's the digital platform, um, that digital platform needs to be um, 100% accessible and, you know, meet those universal um, accessibility principles and the web content guidelines. Uh, and if it meets all of them, it should be accessible for everyone. Um, from, say, the user's perspective, um, it's not up to the website it's not the website's responsibility to ensure the user has the right equipment. So you have, I guess, two sides of the coin. So the user needs to, whether it's through the NDIS or some other kind of equipment um, grant, you, you need to ensure that the, you have the equipment that actually suits your personal requirements. Um, and if the web platform or the digital platform meets the standards, it should all work together. Not the word should. Yeah. Thank you. I think that's unfortunately all the time we have um, for today. We've run a little over, but thank you both for staying with us. Um, if we didn't get to your question, please feel free to send it through to leadership program at australiacouncil.gov.au and we'll happily pass that on to Martin or Jody, and they can get back to you. Um, but Martin, Jody, do you have any final pieces of advice or anything you'd like to leave people with before we wrap up for today? Um, my only thing is, is be upfront about what your requirements are. If you come across something, um, you know, whether it's on a digital platform, um, web, video, et cetera, be upfront um, in a very polite way about the fact that it's not accessible and what they need to do or who they need to speak to or to um, have a look at accessibility. I'm a firm believer in that when people are looking at accessibility, they need to know why they're doing it and what effect it has to actually understand it and you'll find then that people are more uh, happier um, about actually providing it because they actually understand why and where and what they have to do. And I think that's a really important aspect um, because not everyone knows about disability. Not everyone has um, been, has had an experience with someone who has disability. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's really important to make that person aware or that company aware of why 
they need to make something accessible and not just say, because it has to be accessible. Yeah, really great advice. And, um, you can contact Martin and Jody via Access to Arts website. I encourage you to do so. I'm sure they would be, they would love to hear from you. Um, but thank you again for being here today. I'm just going to quickly, before we wrap up, um, remind you that we've got another session this afternoon at 3 p.m. today, which is Finance for Non-Finance Leaders with Michael Gummery. Then on Friday, we'll be hearing from another one of our sector-led sessions with Kate Larson, talking to us about our hybrid future, a guide to flexible, remote and online working, which is very timely, particularly now as we continue to face these uncertainties around COVID outbreaks. Um, the next Wednesday, we'll have a session on strategy with George Leacus from Spark Strategy. And finally, just quickly, a reminder that if you haven't already done so, please, um, we'd really appreciate your thoughts in our midpoint survey to let us know how we're tracking with Creative Connections and what you would like to see more of if we were to continue. We'll post that link in the chat now. But until next time, thank you again for joining us today. Thank you to Martin. Thank you to Jody, our Auslan interpreters, David and Elisa our live captioner, my wonderful team working behind the scenes, and of course, to all of you for joining us. Thank you for being here, and uh, we hope that you'll join us next time. Bye. Thank you. Mm -hmm.